We're gonna we're gonna move on, but just to uh, reiterate what Sam said, we will be um, we've turned that um, slide of those sort of rumble phrases into a shareable WhatsApp picture, um, which we will send out through the various channels. Um, it's just good to have those, some of those phrases in mind. Obviously, you don't have to always use them, but just it's good to have a few options so that you are ready to rumble uh, whenever you need to. Um, we want to be a, a community that I think is really good at having conversations, and I think that the last couple of years of COVID have really hampered our ability to do that. I think the more we live online, the less empathy and compassion and connection we tend to have with others. So hopefully um, that just gives you a bit of language to, to get better at connecting with people. We want to really, as, as much as we can, prevent those whole sort of in-group, out-group dynamics that are so endemic to the human condition. Uh, we're going to move on to the sort of Bible part of the evening. And the two things we're going to be thinking through are theological method. So I'm going to do some input on that now. And then we'll have small group discussion about that. And then we'll think about theological priorities. So when it comes to a theological method, um, the method we want to advocate um, was the one we, sh we sent a link uh, to it, um, developed by Don Carson, but he's not kind of unique in, in this kind of approach. A good method has uh, several interdependent disciplines. So developing a theological perspective on something requires uh, several interdependent disciplines, and here we've got them in nice colorful table formats. I'm just going to explain what these are quickly, and I, I, it, it may sound a little bit abstract, but I'll try and give examples of each as we go along, and I won't dwell on it for too long either. Uh, so the first one, and the kind of uh, primary one, is the fancy word there is exegesis. What that really means is careful reading. All you're doing is you're reading a passage in the Bible and you're trying to figure out what does it say and what does it mean. That can become a bit more technical, but actually that's what you do every day probably whenever you read the Bible or even if you read a verse. If someone says, sends you like, you know, the verse of the day, even there you're actually analyzing. That's what, that's what exegesis does. It analyzes the sentence and um, it, it can get technical depending on, on the grammar or some of the literary features. Um, I actually felt quite clumsy on Sunday trying to explain 1 John 4, because verse 13 is like a statement, verse 14 is a logical connective, verse 15 is a conditional sentence, and you know, it, if, if you're not careful, it gets quite like technical, but the goal with that is just trying to figure out what is John actually saying, um, and expressing that simply <laughs> isn't easy, but that's what you're trying to do there, is just read the Bible. Um, the second thing we then move on to in terms of doing our theological method is what's called, sometimes confusingly called, biblical theology. Uh, this discipline refers to trying to understand the Bible on its own terms. So how is the Bible actually unfolding uh, historically and organically? Uh, this sometimes means that you might focus on a particular section of the Bible, like the first five books or um, all of John's writings. And so the question you might ask, a biblical theology question might ask something like, how does John use the word world? We've seen that a few times in his letters. Or um, you might even trace a theme that comes through the Bible as a whole, but you, uh, you are allowing that theme to develop organically. Like a, a good example of that would be the theme of the temple. How does the theme of the temple unfold throughout the Bible um, from the Old Testament, all the ups and downs, from the tabernacle, David, Solomon, and then in the New Testament, what happens to the theme of the temple? Um, so biblical theology tries to, the, the word is tries to work inductively from the text, which means it's not trying to impose something on the text, it's trying to just allow the text to speak on its own terms. Um, and then sometimes themes will, you know, themes will connect. Obviously, if you think of like the work of the Holy Spirit, that actually dovetails with the theme of the temple. But those are distinct themes, but they can also connect. So biblical theology tries to do that. And what that's doing is that's synthesizing a whole bunch of texts, sometimes on the same theme. 
So if exegesis is the analysis of like one passage, with biblical theology, what you're sometimes doing is you're synthesizing a lot of passages. And that's especially helpful when you think, oh, do these things contradict each other? Um, they don't, but what they often may be doing is giving you a more layered understanding of something. So you think they can, it looks like these might contradict, but actually they fit together, but maybe in a, in a layered way. And that's the task of biblical theology is to figure that out. Um, the third uh, discipline is historical theology. And what this does is give you perspective. Historical theology is, is kind of what it sounds like. It's what have people in the past said about this? And we've got 2,000 years of Christian history to consult. And we believe that the Holy Spirit was at work in previous generations as they did their exegesis and, and their other kind of theological disciplines. And so consulting the, the past can be helpful, doesn't, doesn't make uh, them right, but as C.S. Lewis said, they're unlikely to be wrong in the same way <laughs> as you are. <laughs> um, the other thing we could probably put with historical theology, um, and Carson points this out in that article, is um, reading from other uh, cultures. Um, because what you're trying to do with that discipline is get perspective. How have people in other cultures so that could be in the present, but just in a different culture. That can be very helpful as well. Um, so that's the, third, that's the third discipline. The fourth one is systematic theology, which is, of course, what it sounds like. It's an organized, hierarchical way. Um, this is more we're coming and we're trying to give our, like we're asking questions and trying to get an answer from the Bible. And what that's doing often is integrating a lot of those other disciplines into a kind of a coherent system of thought. And systematic theology books often will do that in specific categories, like they'll begin with the doctrine of the Bible often, then it's doctrine of God, um, and that will obviously focus on Father, Son, and Spirit, doctrine of the church, doctrine of sin, da 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 In fact, I've, I've got um, a systematic theology here, and I'll, just, I'll, I'll give you an example of the kinds of questions. This is actually in the um, table of contents as they talk about things. So for example, God and three persons, the Trinity, how can God be three persons yet one God? Create the doctrine of creation, how, why, and when did God create the universe? Uh, miracles, what are miracles? Can they happen today? Prayer, why does God want us to pray? Angels, what are angels? Those are systematic theology questions. Now you can actually do a biblical theology on those questions as well, but that's not what systematic theology is doing. Um, Systematic theology is very powerful in shaping a worldview. Um, but what's good about this diagram is it helps us remember that everything is connected in the end to the biblical text. The biblical text is the controlling um, authority for all these other disciplines. And then lastly, but not leastly, very important is pastoral theology, which is all about application. And this is really where we live. You know, it's what is... The, <laughs> You know, it's the so what question. So what should I do? What, how should I live in the light of who God is? How do I respond to him? What does he want from me? Um, and so this will connect with a lot of practical issues that we think about, you know, um, church life, your own personal Christian life, um, living in community, living a godly life, um, and, and specific activities maybe like leadership, discipleship, counseling, preaching, all, all those kinds of things, family life, worship, culture. So a good theological method has those different components to it. And what they're actually doing is you're kind of acting as, as a bit of control over each one. Um, so there are distinct tasks, but they also interrelate. And uh, if you read the Carson article, you would have seen these kind of feedback loops. It's not really possible just to do one of those in isolation. Your, your systematic theology will influence your exegesis, your reading of the text. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I think it's just an unavoidable thing, but it's good to know that it does do that. <laughs> and what we all want to do is make sure that the text itself is actually controlling and influencing those other categories. Um, so. Each one of those influences the others, and they all should, in the end, hopefully drive us back to the text, um, which keeps the Bible in the driving seat when it comes to developing our theology. 
Um, one of the ways that um, being clear about this is helpful is that when you read a, a new book or when the church says something, you've actually got a sense of like, how do people come up with their position on something? Like, what should be going into formulating that? And the reason, one of the big reasons we're doing this tonight is to hopefully empower you to feel like, actually, um, I can ask questions about this process, I can get an understanding of how it works. I know it sounds a bit technical, but we live in an information age where more than ever we are getting lots of content and a lot of that is really good. I, I'm you know, a bit of a nerd for that kind of thing, I, I, I enjoy it, but a lot of content isn't always very thoughtful, isn't always very helpful, and I think that the, um, the, the discipline of discernment is you know, more important than ever. And what this is trying to do is just help you think through a good method that you can use when it comes to evaluating theological positions. Have they handled the text correctly? Does that synthesize well with other parts of the Bible? What have previous Christians thought about that? Are we the first people to think this in 2,000 years? That doesn't make it wrong, but there's a good chance it is. <laughs> um, so, so uh, and then how does this integrate with other kind of theological um, truths? And then, and then the final application question is of course incredibly important, so what? So how should I live? What does this mean for my worship of God, my devotion to Him, how I love and serve others? So um, there'll be an opportunity to ask um, questions about that, um, but I hope that um, those are clear. We've got some group discussion questions where you're gonna be able to kind of uh, discuss these uh, with each other. Um, and then of course at the end, we'll have more time for Q&A. Uh, the three questions are, did this framework make sense to you? <laughs> Any questions you want to ask? I'll also be happy to roam around a little bit, so if you want to ask me a question now, that's fine as, as well. Second question, is there one of these categories that you tend to focus on as you read the Bible? Is there one that you tend to overlook? Um, so that, that can be helpful to think through. And then finally, how do you think using these different categories could help you as you read the Bible? So you've got 15 minutes for that. Um, actually a bit longer, um, about 17 minutes. Um, so why don't you get back into your small groups and discuss these things together, thanks.